counsel is mine and sound wisdom. I am understanding. I have strength. This is wisdom speaking. And wisdom, of course, is embodied in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, says the Apostle Paul. And so when wisdom is speaking in the book of Proverbs, you may take for granted that this is an utterance from the very heart of your Savior. You follow that? I, wisdom, verse 12. I, uh, by me, kings reign and princes decree justice and so on. I lead in the way of righteousness that I may cause those that love me to inherit substance and I will fill their treasures. I was set up from everlasting from the beginning or ever the earth was. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no fountains abounding with water and so on. I'm reading from the eighth chapter. This, of course, is a parallel then with the first chapter of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The, the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. And He is before all things, and by Him, says Paul, all things hold together. So when, when uh, Proverbs here uh, speaks of wisdom, you can take for granted that these are truths that come right straight out of the heart of your Savior. If that be so, then we want especially to listen to his feelings about some things. He says, I love them that love me, and those that seek me early shall find me. Riches and honor are with me, durable riches and righteousness. My fruit is better than gold, yea, than fine gold, and my revenue better than choice silver, and so on. Wisdom. Now, in the middle of that, he says, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. To love God also involves the fact that you are going to turn your back on certain other things as a result it's impossible to go in two directions. Our Lord Jesus said ye cannot. He didn't say you must not. He said you cannot serve God and mammon. No man can serve two masters. For either he will love the one and hate the other, or cleave to the one, or depart from the other. Ye cannot, said he, serve God and mammon, or the things of the world, in other words. And so, let us pay some attention, I would urge, to the things that God dislikes, if indeed we are going to profess to love the things he loves. First on the list is pride, and along with it, arrogancy. Now you remember we compared this passage in Proverbs 8 to the more extended uh, passage in uh, Proverbs 6.16. God hates a proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked imaginations, feet that are swift in running to mischief, false witnesses that speak lies, and the person that sows discord among brethren. These two passages are parallel in what they say. In Proverbs 8.13, he says, The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. What is the definition, then, of evil? Pride and arrogancy, first of all. Pride, this is a word that's used only once in the New Testament, and, and it's used right here. Arrogancy is a more general word with a number of shades of meaning that are used any number of times in the Bible. It's translated three times as arrogancy, ten times as excellency, seven times as majesty, five times as pomp, nineteen times as pride, three times as swelling, and one time with the variation of the word proud. The point being that, that pride, as it manifested itself uh, before the creation of the world in the rebellion of Satan, who said, I will be like the Most High, I will exalt my, thr my throne in the sides of the north. Pride, as it manifested itself again in the temptation in the Garden of Eden, when the woman saw that the tree was pleasant to the eyes and good for food and a tree to be desired to make one wise. This was the crowning argument that Satan gave. When you disobey God and partake of this forbidden fruit, you'll be just like he is. You'll know good and evil. And when she saw that, it says she took of the fruit and did eat and gave to her husband also and he did eat. Now, 
putting these things together, something tells me that you and I have to face the fact that God hates a spirit that raises itself up under the heading of pride. The I, me, and mine factor needs to be brought under the control of our blessed Lord Jesus Christ to make the Lord Jesus Lord of all. I have a message I give sometimes from the second chapter of Philippians. What does it mean to make him Lord of all? Lord of your feelings, Lord of your interpersonal relationships, Lord of your motives, Lord of your mind, Lord of your methods, and Lord of your lifestyle, and Lord of your ministry. That's all put together there in the first 16 or 18 verses of Philippians chapter 2. Pride rears its ugly head almost everywhere we look at human nature. Stop here long enough to remark that God does not want you to cancel yourself out and become kind of a human zero, uh, a dedicated nothing. I always wince a little when I hear people singing, I would be nothing, nothing, nothing. Well, um, I don't think maybe that's the, the Lord's plan for us to be consecrated nothings. What he does want, however, is that every thought, 2 Corinthians 10, 5, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. That's what it means. Let the Lord Jesus Christ direct every thought so that your motives and your methods and all of your lifestyle is under his control. That's the only antidote, it seems to me, for pride. Well, then he goes on to say, uh, the evil way. Now, if you go back to Proverbs 6.16, you'll get a commentary on that. The, the evil way, an evil lifestyle, God hates it. Now, why? Because it involves, according to Proverbs 6.16, a lying tongue. God hates that because it involves a lying tongue. One of the evidences that... Uh, the uh, godless, godless atheistic governments of our world are godless is that they don't hesitate to lie in the interest of the state. Any number of, of accounts were given, varying accounts were given. Uh, for example, in the case of the downing of the Korean airliner some time ago. And as the days went by, the story was trimmed a little by little and little until the final account uh, given by uh, the, the uh, Soviets was a good deal different, one would think, than the original reaction. And so we have it again and again in nations that are godless nations or atheistic nations. They are quite sincere in their quest for, uh, for uh, order within their borders and uh, dominance outside of their borders. One doesn't question their sincerity in their purposes. But uh, it would seem, wouldn't it, that in the carrying out of their purposes, their philosophy is, if you have to lie to gain your objective, go ahead and lie. Truth turns out to be a moving target then, and truth is defined as whatever is good for the state. Well, I don't suppose that you and I are going to change them very much. We need to pray. Do you ever pray for Russia? Do you ever pray for the people of China? Huh? Do you ever pray for the Soviet satellite countries in Eastern Europe? Do you ever pray for the people in East Germany, for instance? Now, we differ with them politically. But I think as a Christian, you and I need to pray earnestly that God the Holy Spirit will work in great power in those countries, bringing people to know the Lord Jesus Christ in spite, one may say, of any kind of government pressure that might be applied. Good idea? Well, back to this matter of a lying tongue. 
One of the evidences of godlessness is dishonesty. One of the evidences of godlessness is dishonesty, lying. And one of the first evidences of a changed life is truthfulness. Show me a person who has really met the Lord Jesus, and I'll show you a person who has begun to tell the truth. Interesting, isn't it? The closer you get to God, the more you want to tell the truth. Paul says in Ephesians 4, manifesting the truth in love. There is a loving way to say anything that needs to be said. Now, sometimes the best thing to do is to keep your mouth tight shut. Some wag has said the best way to save face is to keep the lower half of it closed. <laughs> My Hispanic friends will recognize the Spanish, <clears throat> the Spanish proverb that says, En boca cerrado, no entran moscas. In a closed mouth, the flies do not enter. <laughs> well, that's true. But there is a loving way guided by the Holy Spirit of God, who is himself the spirit of love. There is a loving way to say anything that needs to be said. Instead of making a flat-out statement, oftentimes it's good to say, it seems to me, or in my opinion. And a liberal use of, if you please, or what is, what is your opinion, what do you think? These little devices that show consideration for another person are very valuable indeed. A very good rule, I think, to follow oftentimes there's a loving, courteous, considerate way to say anything that needs to be said. But the real test of whether you know the Lord, one of the real tests in any case, is do you tell the truth? God hates a lying tongue. Dear Father, today, help us to be truthful people, honoring our blessed Lord, who is himself the truth. Amen. Till I meet you once again by way of radio, walk with the King today and be a blessing. You've been listening to program number 2459.